extra cost to final consumers and posing significant health challenges because of increased chances of uh, water contamination. So this is a challenge, this is an issue that needs to be challenged. And there are plenty of studies by World Bank and other uh, institutions that reveal the extent of these damages. Here are some statistics, for example, in US alone, six billion gallons of created and pure water and clean water is wasted every day. And these leakages and pipe water losses due to leakages and pipe failures is a significant, significant factor in that. And there are many other uh, uh, statistics that reveal that how uh, big this issue is. So I guess this cartoon uh, in one of the World Bank reports does make sense that we need to address the, the, the pipe failures and leakages through many different means. So in this work, our objective is to have an efficient localization and identification of pipe failures uh, uh, by, by using different kind of sensors. So uh, what we, the approach that we adopt is to design and solve some sensor placement problems that maximizes the location, localization and detection of these pipe failures or leakages while deploying the minimum number of sensors deployed. So thus minimizing the cost that is incurred by the deployment of these sensors. In specifically, what we use is that we formulate this detection and localization problem as combinatorial coverage problems, and then we present some efficient heuristics in order to solve these problems, which are scalable and pertinent to solving, and pertinent in the, uh, for, the, for these large scale systems. And the existing algorithms do not work very well with these kind of networks. We also see the scope of multi-level sensors for this detection of these pi failures and bursts. Multi-level sensors here mean uh, that the information that is collected from the sensors is analyzed in more deeper details. And we also see that how the different classes of these multi-level sensors can be used in combination so that we can, uh, we can exploit the trade-off between the performance of localization and the, um, uh, and the cost incurred by, by these sensors. And we, we analyze, we provide an, an analysis of our approaches and our propositions, and we also provide simulations uh, to the real water networks and some other benchmark networks. So to begin with, uh, uh, we model the water distribution network as a graph in which the pipes are, or the links are represented by the edges and the, the nodes represent the consumers or the connections of these pipes. Since we are talking about the pipe failure, so the event set, is, event set is simply defined over the set of links or edges, and our sensor set is the set of the nodes. In a very simple or naive uh, single level sensing, we say that a sensor detects a failure at a certain pipe if the pressure, uh, before that, there, there can be many different modalities that we can measure by, uh, from the network using these sensors. Here we are looking at the pressure that is being measured by uh, by the pressure sensors deployed in the network. So a sensor is uh, detecting the pressure drop, and if that pressure drop uh, is greater than a certain threshold, then, the, uh, then we say that the sensor detects an output which is indicated by an, uh, by an output of one, and which is zero otherwise. So here we have uh, a simple network, and we can see that there is some kind of uh, burst or leakage that happened on the, on the link L1. And this is the raw pressure data that is collected from the sensors that are deployed at nodes two and nodes five. So the pressure drop here at a certain time instant is greater than a certain threshold which is indicated by, uh, by, the, by the value of one uh, over here. So in order to capture the effect of sensors, uh, effect of these failure events on the sensors, we can, we can, we can write down a Boolean influence matrix uh, so, uh, which, in which the rows represent the set of events, which are pipe failures in our case, and the, these columns represent the sensor outputs. So for, and the, the ijth element of this, uh, uh, of this matrix would reveal that what would happen if an event i happens, what would be the output of, uh, of the sensor here? For instance, this symbol entry over here shows that link L3, as a, as a result of the failure on link L3, the output of the sensor S8 is one. Okay, so now from the, from the network model, uh, which where the network model simply means the physical dynamics that dictate the, uh, the, the dynamics of the flow, and the event disturbance model, which is actually the uh, modeling of the transient or the pressure wave, pressure front that is generated along the pipes. And then the, using the sensing model, we write our influence model, which is simple a Boolean matrix in our case over here. So what is the localization problem now? 
the localization problem is to select the minimum number of sensors so that maximum number of event failures can be uniquely detected and localized. So in our case, using in, the, in terms of the Boolean matrix, our job is to select the minimum columns, minimum number of columns, so that each row in that set of columns is a unique output. That's how we can distinguish between them. So let's consider one, one particular event, let's say Li. So in order to distinguish Li from some other event, Lj, what we need to do is that we must have a sensor that should give us a different output in response to event Li and Lj. So similarly, if you want to distinguish Li from all different Lj's, we need to have a sensor for each Li-Lj pair that should give us a different output for, that, for, the, uh, for the events Li and Lj. So if we have for each pair of events, if we have a unique sensor, if we have a sensor that is giving a different output for, that, for the events in that pair, then we are able to uniquely detect or localize that particular failure. And it turns out that this objective or this, uh, uh, this objective is precisely the problem of a minimum test cover in, in combinatorics. So what is a minimum test cover? We have a simple finite set of elements and then there's a collection of a subset of these elements. And our job is to, is to select a smaller collection over here so that for each x, y pair, if there existed a subset in this collection that was giving a different output for x and y, then in our smaller subcollection, we should also have some sort of uh, this subset over here that should also give the different output for the pair, for, for the elements in this pair x and y. This is precisely the minimum test cover problem. So we can see what, what really it means again by just a simple example over here. So this was our influence matrix for this particular graph. And we can see that if you select the sensors one, two, th if, uh, one, two, three, and five, meaning we, if we pick the columns one, two, three, and five, then we can uniquely detect or identify all the events which are indicated by the rows over here. Because each row in this, in this selected set of columns has a unique output. So the sensor set one, two, three, and five is our minimum test cover. So how we can actually compute this minimum test cover? So again, we can transform this minimum test cover problem or reduce this minimum test cover problem to actually a set cover problem. Again, using the same intuition that I just described that we can uniquely, we can distinguish between the events Li and Lj whenever we pick a sensor, whenever there's a sensor that is giving us a different output for event Li and Lj. So how we can do that? So we have this, we have an instant of, uh, instance of test cover here where these L and this subscript, uh, superscript corresponds to the test cover instance. So this L contains the set of the events which are the pi failures. This ST contains the set of sensor outputs. So S1 contains the set of events that are detected by the sensor SI over here. So from that instance, we create a set cover instance as following. That we, as I mentioned, that we create uh, corresponding to each pair, we create an element in that set cover. So we call this, so for the pair Li, Lj, we create a new element Eij over here. And the co corresponding to this collection over here, we create a new collection and which contains, in which the, uh, in which the Ei, uh, the, in which which contains these elements S, E, I, J, but only when uh, the, so S, I over here contains E, I, J if and only if the S, I can only detect one of L, I or L, J events. This is, this uh, can be, this, this is a, this could be clear from this example over here. For example, this was our original influence matrix, meaning the test cover instance. So what we are doing here is that this L1, so uh, this row, uh, this L1 uh, row tells us that which sensors detect uh, uh, this event L1, and the column tells us that, for example, S1 over here tells us that the, uh, the sensor S1 detects all the events uh, for which its value is 1. So for the L1, L2 pair, we create a new row in our transform matrix, and the value of the sensor over here would be 0 if the output of the sensors, uh, if the output of the sensor for both of those events is exactly the same. So meaning we are actually taking an exclusive or over here. So corresponding to this uh, 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 sensor one, since L1 and L2 has exactly same output, so we cannot distinguish between L1 and L2 using this sensor, uh, S1, that's why we put a zero over here. And similarly, we can see that 
uh, using sensor four, the output for L1 and L2 is different if you use sensor four or sensor five. That's why the, the, there is the, the corresponding entry in this new transform matrix is one over here, meaning that using the sensor four, we can distinguish between the even L1 and L2. So, so once we create this transform matrix, then our job becomes simple because now we just have to select a minimum number of columns over here that covers all these pairwise events. And this is simply a set cover problem. And we know that there are many nice and efficient heuristics to solve this set cover problem. Okay, so one of the uh, uh, greedy approaches here is that obtain a transform matrix and then solve the set cover problem. And set cover problem is to select the column uh, in each iteration that covers or detects the maximum number of uh, uncovered or undetected pairwise events. And it, it has been shown previously that uh, this greedy approach actually is the best approach in terms of the approximation ratio of the solution. But there's a problem over here, and the problem is the following, that, uh, that, uh, that this approach is actually computationally quite expensive. In each iteration, the number of uh, elements that we, need to, that we need to compare or that we need to check is actually of order n choose two, because if we have n link failures, the number of pairwise link failures would be n choose two. So this is not very good for the large scale networks. So what we did is that we proposed an algorithm in which we do not, and in this algorithm, the basic reason or the, the, the basic cause of this, uh, uh, of this computational cost is the transformation step that requires to transform all link failures into the pairwise link failures. So we propose an algorithm in which we get rid of this step and we don't need to transform all link failures into the pairwise link failures. And uh, the, our solution gives exactly the, our solution is exactly the same as the greedy approach. We can say that it is basically an efficient implementation of this greedy algorithm. And if k is the maximum number of link failures that are detected by any sensors, then our algorithm is approximately k by n times uh, less computationally expensive because the number of comparisons that we need to make in each iteration is of this order. So what the, so uh, I'll just briefly describe what is the, the two simple basic observations that we utilize in our approach is that uh, an element that detects k link failures simply detects k into n minus k pairwise link failures. So we don't need to exactly see that which pairwise link failures that it detects, number one. And number two is that if, uh, if, if, uh, uh, if a certain set of, I mean, uh, if a sensor detects Li and Lj, that it can never distinguish between Li and Lj uh, as, uh, as I just described. So if the sensor is selected in the test cover, then we still need to select some sensor that can detect the pairwise link failures, uh, uh, that are pairwise link failures corresponding to the link failures is corresponding to the event set that is detected by the element that has been selected already in, the, in that test cover. So by using these simple uh, uh, observations, so what we, de what we need to do in each iteration is actually we compute this score over here. Uh, and as I mentioned, with the, if n i, we don't, we are not actually transforming each, uh, the, we are not transforming or computing the pairwise link failures now, but because we know that an element that has k, that can detect k link failures can detect k into n minus k pairwise link failures. So if n i, okay. So if Ni is the total number of undetected link failures that are uh, in, our, uh, in our sample space, and Ki is the number of link failures that are detected by the sensor, uh, uh, un uh, the number of uncovered link failures detected by the sensor, then the first element in our score is computed by this fact. And then we also need to see that how many pairwise link failures corresponding to the links uh, that are already covered by some of the sensor in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the test cover, how many of those pairwise link failures are detected by this new sensor. So by combining this, we compute a score, and the one that maximizes this uh, gives us the, uh, is selected in that iteration. And this solution gives exactly the same solution as our greedy approach. Okay, so uh, here's that table that simply shows uh, that if you compare different approaches, what are the results? And uh, here we are comparing uh, for three different networks, the identification score and the localization score. Identification is, score is simply the fraction of the pairwise link failures that are detected by the, uh, by the selected sensors. And localization score is the num number of unique, uh, unique signatures that we obtain as a result of our selected sensors. 
okay, so now quickly moving on to, I don't have a lot of time, but quickly moving on to this multi-level sensing. So right now we are just saying that uh, whether if a sensor detects an event, it gives an output of one. If it doesn't detect, it, it is zero. But if the information that we are collecting from the sensor, if we analyze it in more deeper details, uh, then we can actually, uh, uh, we can represent the output of the sensor in multiple bits, right? For example, if you select the time of arrival, if we are somehow able to measure the time of arrival, then we can say, based on that, we can distinguish or the, we, can, we can write the output of the sensor in multiple bits. For example, if the, uh, if, the, if the event detected by the sensor lies within this range, then its output is one zero. If it's in another range, it would be zero one. So nutshell uh, is, is that we can, we can uh, write the output of the sensor in multiple bits. So is this advantageous? We know as, as intuitively it should give us more, uh, it should be better. Um, I can just skip because of the time. So based on that, we can repeat the same procedure as we did for the single level mo uh, model, and we can write a new influence matrix, but again, uh, uh, as we expect that now the columns, number of columns will increase, uh, will multiply based on the number of output bits that we have over here. And it is simply this analysis showing that it is, is verifying our intuition that yes, indeed, these multi-bit sensors are actually uh, are better for the localization purposes. Uh, this simple analysis over here shows that if P1 over here is the number of pairwise link failures that are detected by a one-bit sensor, then our corresponding sigma bit sensor, where the output consists of sigma bits, can, can, do, can actually detect that many pairwise link failures. This number is always going to be positive. So we, clearly this uh, sigma bit sensor is better than the one bit sensor. And how much better, we know exactly over here. And uh, the, the final simulations here show, we can show that by using these multi-bit sensors, we are, uh, we are improving our performance in, on two, uh, different, in two different directions. Firstly, the maximum number of pairwise link failures or the localization uh, uh, th that we can achieve is increasing. And secondly, the number of sensors required to achieve that level of localization is reducing. And for instance, in this figure, we can, we can see that uh, if you use these black curves, which are representing the output of one-bit sensors, then uh, the localization score is actually clearly better for these red plots, which represent the uh, uh, case of two-bit sensors. And also, we can see that the number of sensors that are required to achieve this high level of local localization is also, de is also decreasing in the case of higher-bit sensors, which is two-bit sensors over here. Uh, and also we can use the heterogeneous sensors, last 20 seconds. So we can use different levels, uh, a combination of one bit and two bit or hybrid sensors in these uh, water networks and, can, and using that we can actually have a, have a control over a trade off between the, or we can do the trade off between the performance and the number of sensors that are deployed, which actually is an indication of the cost. For instance, this lower line over here indicates the localization score when all one bit sensors are used. This upper line shows the localization score, maximum localization score when all two-bit sensors are used. But if you use a combination of both, we can actually, we can see that there is a, there is a nice trade-off over here. So we can, we can pick this trade-off. And also, uh, what is the, uh, if we have these hybrid sensors, where should we, or these more sophisticated sensors, let's say, then where should we deploy them within the network? So this is a, this is a very important question. And, uh, the simplest approach is that different, using different centrality-based measures, network centrality-based measures, do they serve as a good choice for, for such a selection? And it turns out, using our simulations, that this is not a, a right choice as we compare the localization scores uh, when we deploy these more sophisticated sensors using different network centrality-based measures and these greedy-based heuristics. So uh, these, these centrality-based measures do not serve as a good choice. So uh, brief and concluding this talk, so what we see is that we can, uh, we can, we can write down or we can formulate these, coverage, uh, these localization identification problems at different sort of coverage problems, and we propose efficient heuristics in order to solve these problems. And then we have also shown that uh, in, a, in a quantitative as well as qualitative way that how these higher level sensors, which are actually more sophisticated and perform do, and are doing some uh, better analytics are better than the uh, one-bit sensors. And, the, and also that how we can achieve a trade-off using heterogeneous sensors or a combination of these multi-bit sensors and one-bit sensors. Thank you. <laughs>